Protocol layers is one of those topics that people can find a little bit confusing, it's a bit abstract. So let's see if we can make more sense of it by looking at some examples. So this is an example of the TCP IP layer model. There are different models for how you can break protocols up. Uh, this is one that's really relevant to the GCSE specification, but you don't actually need to know the particular specifics of any model. You just need to know the principles of using layers. Anyway, in the TCP IP layer model, we split network communications up into four different layers. You've got the application layer at the top, then there's a transport layer, an internet layer, and a network layer, or sometimes that's called a link layer. Now, every one of these different layers has different protocols that work in that layer. So in the application layer, uh, common protocols might be HTTP and HTTPS. Those are for accessing websites from web servers. There's the FTP or file transfer protocol, which is used for sending files between computers. SMTP for sending email, IMAP and POP for receiving email. At the transport layer, uh, you might come across TCP for Transmission Control Protocol, um, but there are others. There's also UDP um, and SPX, and these have different benefits and different roles to play depending on what you're trying to achieve on your network. The only one of those you need to know about at GCC, though, is TCP. Uh, then in the internet layer, you've got IP version 4, which is probably the one you're most familiar with. You'll get IP addresses like 192.168.0.1, uh, or there's the newer IP version 6, which is a little bit uh, more complicated. Use a longer digits in their addresses, and that's to overcome the problem of running out of space on the internet. Um, and there's also then finally the network or link layer. Um, now this is this has loads of protocols as well, but we tend not to think of them so much as protocols because this is much more to do with how the hardware works. So actually the things going on at the network layer is how are you actually sending the data in a physical way? So uh, ethernet, all of the rules that uh, relate to how data is electronically sent over the ethernet protocol all apply here. So that's things like using MAC addresses to send data to specific hardware interfaces and devices. The device driver that tells your operating system how to use its network card, um, the different Wi-Fi standards for the speed and the frequencies and so on that are being used, switches, network switches and how they talk to each other, all of that's happening at this bottom layer of the protocol stack. So each layer is self-contained. This is a really important principle. Uh, because it means that every layer doesn't need to know that much about the other layers, they just need to know how to interface with the layer above and below. So if you're writing an application, you do not need to worry about how it's going to be physically transmitted across the world. Um, and using this approach, therefore, significantly simplifies the development of networked software applications and network hardware. So again, you can write applications without needing to know what hardware is going to be involved in sending that networked data. Equally, you can create a, a hardware device for sending network data without needing to know what applications are going to make use of it. So just to illustrate this point, um, here we've got um, the TCP protocol in place in the transport area, um, but we could switch that out if we wanted to, and we could bring UDP in instead. Uh, they both have different benefits. TCP is fantastic if you want to make sure that every single data packet arrives at its destination intact, and you're prepared to wait for the data to get there. But sometimes you want low latency, and it's okay if you drop a few packets. A good example would be if you're making a Wi-Fi call, if you're using voice over IP. You don't really mind if you lose a packet, because that might just be something someone said three or four seconds ago. You'd rather not wait for that. Instead, you'd rather get on with the conversation. And UDP prioritizes getting data to you quickly, not worrying about whether that data actually makes it completely intact or not. So let's look at some specific examples. Let's imagine we're trying to request a web page from a web server, and we're going to be using HTTP to do that. So data is going to travel from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack. And the first thing that's going to happen is that your web browser at the application layer, this is a client application, is going to generate an HTTP request for a particular file from the web server. That's then going to get split up into small packets by TCP, and it gives each one of those packets a sequence number and something called a checksum, which is used to ensure that the data has been received correctly at the other end. 
IP is then going to be involved. It's going to take those uh, those packets from TCP and it's going to add IP addresses onto them for the server where the um, request has to ultimately get to. It's also going to add on the IP address of the person sending it so that it knows how to come back. And as it travels through the network, IP is involved within all of the routers. So the routers across the world, they use a system called packet switching to send data to each other and ultimately onto the final destination. And all of that's done by checking, hey, what's the IP address of where this data is supposed to go and where has it come from? And ultimately, I suppose, that information you're sending has to be broken down into binary data, which is gonna get sent either as some kind of electrical signal or it's gonna be sent as radio waves if this is Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, or it's gonna be sent as light pulses if it's fiber optic. So that's all happening at the link layer right at the very bottom. We've taken our data, we've split it up, we've stamped on some addresses as to where it goes, and now we need to take that binary data and put it into some kind of electrical form so that it can get sent to um, other devices across the network. And it'll actually get sent, the, the, the ethernet layer or the the network layer isn't so much concerned about where is it ultimately destined to go, that's IP's job. All this link layer is worried about is how do I send it to the next piece of hardware that I'm linked to? So it uses MAC addresses to determine, right, what's the next physical piece of hardware I need to send this packet to? And that might not be the next router. For example, if this is coming from your computer, um, it might be that the next piece of hardware it's got to send this data to is the wireless access point. And from the wireless access point, maybe it has to send it, the next place it needs to go is to a switch. And from that switch, maybe it needs to go to a router. To make the point that this, these are all interoperable and swappable, we could look at sending an email. The only difference we need to make to the overall model here is instead of using HTTP, we're going to be using SMTP. And it's going to generate some kind of initiation on the sender's mail server. Um, so SMTP is going to sit there working away on the on the sender's mail server and it's going to try and set up some kind of communication with the recipient's mail server to say, hey, I've got a message for you. Um, but everything else is the same. TCP's role is the same, IP's role is the same, Ethernet's role or the link layer's role. They're all the same. The only thing that's changed is that we've swapped out HTTP and we've swapped in SMTP. So these examples are all to do with sending data. Well, let's look at one that shows us how data is received in this model. So we're gonna talk about receiving a file from another computer via FTP. So we need to swap out SMTP, swap in FTP, and notice that the direction of travel through the stack has now been reversed. We're gonna go from bottom to top. So the first thing that happens is that electrical signals are received by the network interface on your computer. Uh, and that needs to be converted into binary data and then that gets sent into the operating system where IP will be working to check that the address is the correct address for the recipient. It'll also check where it's come from and that will help it identify um, whether this um, communication is, is valid, do I need to use a firewall to knock it out or whatever else. Um, that packet, assuming that it has been received at the correct place, is going to be um, inspected by TCP where it's checked to make sure that it's been received correctly. Uh, and it will do that by using that checksum, which is a special number. It will do some kind of processing on the packet. And once it's finished that processing, it will check if its result matches the checksum. If it does, it's fairly confident that that packet has been received correctly. And then it will actually look, it will wait and get all of the packets it needs based on sequence number. So if it knows it's it's got packet 65 out of 110, it will wait until all 110 packets have been delivered and it will then assemble them all into the correct order and then that can be passed back to the FTP application that's running on the computer which can receive that data as binary data and given that this is an FTP server it's going to store that as a file on its host machine. So let's just recap again the key points of the TCP IP layer model. The network communication is split into layers. Doing that means that different protocols will operate at different layers within the model. And each layer is self-contained, so you only need to know how to interface with the layer above or below. And the big benefit of all of this 
is that it significantly simplifies the development of both networked software applications and also network hardware for software developers, for engineers, and for hardware technicians.